We are back, ladies and gentlemen, Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. It is always a pleasure to welcome to the program the, I want to say the hardest working uh, man in journalism, but it's not just that. Uh, because, you know, this is not, uh, there, there is, there's so much more uh, to this man's talent than just uh, his hard working. And I, I don't even know if he sleeps. Um, you may have read his writing in just about every publication that you've ever read. But um, David Dane, welcome to the program. Thank you, Samuel. Um, now, uh, David, let's talk about uh, your most recent piece. This was not in The Intercept, although you had a recent piece in The Intercept, multiple pieces, um, not in any of the other uh, uh, 50 other publications you write for. Uh, you wrote a piece in The New Republic uh, in response to, uh, or at least I guess this is maybe a partial reminder, the um, the op-ed that is supposedly from a high-level uh, White House official uh, talking right. about how they're usurping uh, Donald Trump uh, in uh, office. We'll, let's leave that aside for a moment anyways. Um, but um, you took the occasion to uh, retell the story of Tim Geithner. And, of course, we, this is the week uh, that uh, Lehman Brothers uh, crashed, right? Uh, ten, yeah. ten years ago? Are we in the ten, ten years ago on Saturday? Wow, there you go. And so, um, tell us that story. This is, and, and for folks who are uh, younger, don't remember. It started like, like I guess it would have been in August, right? Uh, that Bear Stearns shuttered just immediately. That was actually uh, March. Oh, was it March? Two thousand eight. Oh, jeez. So, okay. I mean, the 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 housing bubble started to you know collapse under its own weight at the end of 2006 and this thing kind of in a very protracted way led to a cascade of different uh closures uh and 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 things of that nature whether it was new century financial and ameriquest which were mortgage originators uh some hedge funds from bear stearns that closed up in 2007 uh, and then this started to infect the balance sheets of these large investment banks, which uh, had a lot of mortgage-backed securities on their books, uh, as well as derivatives uh, uh, that were sort of uh, uh, one step removed, but were based on the prices of mortgages. Uh, and, uh, you know, you had Bear Stearns collapse, uh, and then Lehman was sort of the next Big one. Bear Stearns was purchased by J.P. Morgan uh, at a at a fire sale rate, uh, and Lehman was seeking a buyer, and uh, eventually it was allowed to go bankrupt. And this really was the emblematic event of the financial crisis because uh, it it showed that there was the potential for, you know, the lack of a rescue, a a, a sort of un unstructured bankruptcy and uh this led to a lot of things in the credit system that really uh seized up uh the the, the broader uh financial system and, and 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 led to the bailout so now uh cut to the first quarter of 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 2009 obama's right. now president um the and things are still going badly right right i mean that that's the thing we have to explain so uh the banks are are certainly not uh in a a healthy situation we are losing uh on the order of 700 to 800,000 jobs a month uh new policies have yet to to really be put in place and take effect and uh, across uh, Obama's economic team, there are varying viewpoints as to what to do, particularly about now it's coming to the commercial banks, the big mega banks like Bank of America and Citigroup in particular. These uh, banks have lost billions of dollars in the fourth quarter of 2008. Uh, their stocks are being punished 
Citigroup stock in the first quarter of 2009 was as low as 97 cents. <laughs> it, wow. was, it was like a penny stock. Uh, and this is, this is a huge global bank. Um, and uh, there are these serious conversations being had over, you know, possibly to nationalize these large banks, which we did see elsewhere in the world. Uh, you know, in, in England and, and, and other places. So, and, and in the previous decade, Sweden used this, uh, to nationalize its banks during a financial crisis, uh, to, to decent results. So, and, and uh, let me just, yeah. just, just give folks just a metaphor so they can understand sort of like how this happens. It's like, as if like, um, you have a, a, a small, uh, particle, you know, in your fuel and it goes in, and it starts causing different problems as it works its way through the system. Right. And okay. it, it compounds other problems. So, uh, at first it starts off as a spec and this is, and then it, it just, uh, as it goes through the system, the, the problem becomes more and more problematic. So by the time we're in March of 2009, it takes that long to realize just how bad the situation is for some of these banks. And part of it is also because they, they were on a mission to sort of hide how bad things were because everybody's, you know, covering their ass at that point. That's number one. And number two is the fact that these balance sheets uh, were so interconnected. The, the, the financial system is, 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 you know, incredibly linked to one another. So a problem, uh, or at least it was at that time, so a problem in one aspect of the system just sort of flows through and affects everybody else. And Citigroup uh, had a tremendous amount of uh, liabilities on its balance sheet. We had already been through two different bailouts of Citigroup. One, the, the TARP bailout, which was $25 billion of capital that was supplied to them. That wasn't enough. In November of 2008, there was a second $20 billion bailout, and that wasn't taking either. Okay, uh, wait, so now explain something to us, David. So we've given them $45 billion, all right? right. And I understand the metaphor. It's like it's a bucket. And it, you can't see the bottom of the bucket, and it just ends up having no bottom, and it just goes down to this sort of black pit. But, but what do they do with that money? Like, we give them $45 billion. Who gets right. that money, and why does it have no impact? Well, it's a capital uh, uh, infusion, and what it's meant to do is to uh, shore up the, you know, the, the day-to-day operations liabilities that it has to pay out, the write-downs, that uh, the bank has to take on its losses. Uh, it's supposed to absorb all that. And, and as you say, it's, it's like catching a falling knife. They, the, the losses were just mounting on the balance sheet, and, and there was no way to, to really use, you know, that money was, was, was limited in, in the functions it could do to actually, uh, uh, you know, offset these tremendous losses that were going on. And so... There were a lot of uh, things talked about what to do with Citigroup. One was to sort of shield off their worst assets, put them in what is called a bad bank, uh, and, and, and try to have the rest of the bank go forward with its so-called good assets uh, and, 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 you know, just sort of ring fence those bad assets and put them in a separate unit that ended up actually happening um the other option was essentially to break up citigroup and larry summers actually argued for this option uh sheila bear was consulted about this option there was a meeting in march of 2009 march 15 where the economic team was talking about these different ways in which they could they could either completely nationalized, which would be take Citigroup and, 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 and put it on the, the, the government, at least for a period of time, uh, or to uh, break it up into parts and sell those parts off. And uh, what the upshot of that meeting uh, on March 15, 2009, according to Ron Susskind, who wrote this book, Confidence Men, he said that uh, the, the idea was to cleave off the worst assets, wipe out the shareholders, 
and downsize and restructure the rest of the firm. And Obama... All right, but now wait, before, by the way, before we get to that mm-hmm. part of it, I just want, want people to really understand these different options. If we were to nationalize the bank, what would that mean in practice? Like, how would that stop the, that, if I understand it, it wouldn't do anything other than saying, if we're going to spend tax dollars on this, right? If we're just going to keep shoveling money right. into this system, regardless of whether we break it up or not or whatever we do, it's just that if we're going to keep paying for this, we want to own it. <laughs> and, uh, right. like, you know, that's just, that's just like, we're not. Well, the other part of it, the other part of it is the financial system is in, in some respects based on confidence. The idea that, uh, investors uh, and depositors believe that the money that they put into the system will be able to come back out. And so when you put the full faith and credit of the United States behind it, uh, you, you tend to raise that confidence level uh, rather than relying on Citigroup, which has proven itself a failure uh, and, and has this tremendous amount of liabilities on its balance sheet. So, so that was part of it as well. Okay. And so, um, and then there's this option of, and then, so it's, it's a combination of one, you will lend the, uh, the, the confidence that the United States government represents to the bank Two, you will not be spending tax dollars and getting nothing in return. The other options are basically like if I had a, a small bodega and I had uh, sadly made the mistake of investing in all sorts of uh, products that I'm going to stock on my shelves that nobody wants, like, you know, I don't know, fur right. sinks or whatever it is. But my uh, lottery sales uh, business is doing OK. So you cleave those two uh, apart. And, uh, yeah. you know, um, if my uh, father in law had given me all this money to buy the fur sinks and he was like, this is a great idea. You just store the fur, fur sinks there. People come and buy it. He's the one who's just not going to get repaid. And uh, the lottery uh, uh, part of the business is just going to go on. Is basically it. Yeah, that that that's a decent enough uh, analogy. So, um, so this was put out there, and and you know, Obama was on the record at this point saying we can't do Sweden, we can't do nationalization. Uh, he used some kind of spurious reasons to say so, uh, but he signed off on this idea that uh, we were going to come up with a resolution for Citigroup. And he wrote an order to the Treasury Department, this is all according to Seskin's book, uh, that the Treasury Department needed to prepare, uh, you know, hash out the details of how this would actually work. It wasn't, he wasn't saying to the Treasury, you know, execute the resolution of Citigroup. He was saying, you need to prepare for it. Uh, and write me a, uh, a a plan, an outline of how this would look in practice. And City, uh, uh, the Treasury Department, which was led by Timothy Geithner at that point, didn't do this. They, they, they simply didn't follow this request. They didn't produce any proposal uh, for the, the wind down of Citigroup. Uh, and, uh, they just waited and waited and they, you know, instead treasury continued with the strategy that they had in the first place, which was continuing to protect the banks at all costs. That was Geithner's worldview. That was his plan. Uh, he executed this through a third bailout of Citigroup. Uh, he, 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 you know, shot the money cannon at, at city with federal reserve loans and guarantees. Uh, and, uh, he continued the stress tests, uh, which were designed to, uh, kind of promote this confidence among, uh, the markets by saying that we have now, uh, run the numbers and in an adverse scenario, uh, this bank will need X amount of dollars in capital in order to survive. And uh, while initially the number that they generated for the first stress test for Citigroup was something like $35 billion, there was essentially a negotiation session between Citigroup and the government uh, that got that number down to just $5 billion. Right. And when that number came up as so small, the investor class was reassured that, okay, well, Citigroup doesn't need that much money 
uh, their balance sheet must be healthy, and so we'll continue to invest in Citigroup. And, and all of those things cumulatively kind of nursed Citigroup back to health, rendering the need for this proposal that Obama asked for uh, less relevant. And so, uh, you know, Tim Geithner resisted the, the direct presidential order, uh, did his own thing, uh, and, and move forward. And, and how is that exactly any different than what this unnamed official is saying they're doing uh, with respect to the Trump administration? Uh, the only difference is, is that uh, the unnamed official is admitted they're doing it. And a uh, Geithner would probably <laughs> would say like, no, we, we just <sighs> couldn't get them. To, it's, I kept saying, do it. I mean, I, the, I indeed, mean, indeed Geithner did, deny that this happened uh he, he said i don't slow walk the president on anything but of course you know suskin asked obama about this uh and 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 he said you know the 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 i, I think the quote is the speed with which the bureaucracy could exer- exercise my decision was slower than i wanted Right. So uh, read between the lines. It, it happened. I don't think Obama was particularly upset about it because it worked out, and he wasn't exactly a, a radical on bank retribution or anything. But, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty clear to me that, that this is the, the way that this went down. And we, and we should also be clear that there, you know, this is not necessarily a no harm, no foul type of situation. I mean, this would have... To uh, to get rid of or to break apart um, one of the biggest systemic risks we have that comes in the form of Citibank. I mean, and, and this is a conversation, you know, in 10 years, maybe five years, uh, you and I will revisit and we'll say, yeah, it's too bad they didn't break <laughs> up Citibank at that time because of this next financial crisis that comes along. Yeah, but I would say a couple things about it. Um, number one, uh you know, the way in which Geithner saved the system and preserved the system rather than overhauling it made it easier for today the Trump administration to effect, uh, effectively dismantle the rules and safeguards and tweaks uh, to the current system. You know, uh, they've, they've completely game, uh, uh, weakened and softened the, the stress tests, which were kind of the top thing Geithner was using to uh, promote market confidence. They, uh, uh, Larry Summers came out uh, a few days ago and called them comically absurd. Um, and, and we continue to see uh, rampant uh, abuse of consumers, whether you're talking about Wells Fargo or whoever, uh, with l- very little enforcement being done because the Trump administration has kind of called off the guards. So when you preserve that system, uh, all of the potential abuses and breakdowns of that system can return and now they've returned within 10 years rather than you know after the 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 depression we had the new deal reforms that lasted about 50 years so that's number one number two is the political implications of uh throwing money at any major institution in the financial world uh and and not doing the same for homeowners the implications were a slower economic recovery uh, the, the, the implication was, uh, mass political anger and frustration at, uh, the two tiered system, uh, where banks got bailed out and everybody else got left out. And, uh, this leads to the rise of populism and, uh, the, the presidency that we have today, I would argue. So this was not costless. And, and, and taking the second one first and then the first one second, I, I am increasingly um, uh, feeling that like the the one of the untold stories of the uh, of Trump's ascendancy is is not so much that people turn to Trump uh, as much as they just didn't show up because they were just like, you know, just disgusted by the whole system uh, on some level and Mm -hmm. that it, it, that it was demoralizing for people to see this, to see, to hear stories of like, Hey, $45 billion just dumped into this, you know, uh, this black hole of Citibank without even sort of questioning it. And, um, and these stress tests, which are, you know, tend to remind me of like, 
It's almost like saying they have a triple A rating, right? From from a uh, from a, a Moody's or something like that. They, these banks are fine, and um, I, I, I think that's a, that 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 became a huge sense of of disillusionment for people. I don't know if they could get so granular with it as much as just sort of this overriding sense of like there's no accountability that everything uh, that to the extent that anybody's going to suffer, it's not going to be those institutions that actually were directly involved in this mess, but rather people who are downstream from it. And and just in terms of the first thing, it seems to me that much of the legislative achievements of the Obama administration and, you know, people can uh, debate as to how significant they were, you know, in a vacuum, right? Whether it's Dodd Frank or whether it was like the ACA, the lesson of the Trump administration relative to those achievements have been: if you, if if you don't take a meat cleaver to a problem and fundamentally redesign uh, the system that led to that problem, any sort of add-ons, uh, you know, any type of like like narrow fixes that you uh, offer for that system, right? So like uh, the, the ACA in terms of private insurance and all of these like all built on a series of regulatory fixes about the markets and this and that and the same with Dodd-Frank, all like sort of small bore. All we need are these 23 different small elements that will create this reform. The lesson it seems to be is that that can get unwound super easy, <laughs> easily. Like Correct. They're, they're, they're no, the, that is not durable solution at all to create uh, that type of like, regulatory structure on a major problem. Right. Whereas if you had a size cap uh, uh, on the largest banks, uh, which is something that was proposed during Dodd-Frank and ultimately uh, got a vote but failed, uh, even if the Trump administration sought to reverse that side cap or give allowances to that size cap, you know, the, 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 the banks had already have already been downsized, right? So it's going to take some time to rebuild uh, that asset uh, allocation. So um, you know there there's there's a, a big difference between uh, an, an overhaul, which you know has to get reconstituted in some way, even if the laws change, and uh, a a technocratic kind of tweak to the system and and which can get unraveled uh, very rapidly and has been so uh yes well and, and you have a quote from uh, adam twos uh from his new book crashed and, and we're going to speak to him i think it's next week um, yeah it's it's a remarkable book and i highly recommend it uh, he, you, you quote him as writing, uh, we do not need to imagine that he, speaking of Geithner, was in the pocket of any one bank. It was his commitment to the system that dictated this, that Citigroup should not be broken up. Like that to me is a, um, is the story of the Obama administration in many respects. And right. it also sort of explains, you know, you don't. It's not a quid pro quo when somebody goes and gets paid by a bank to speak in front of them or gets hired after they leave the administration. It's because they are of that ilk and right. you hire uh, you hire in that way. They're marinated in that worldview. I mean, Geithner gets so bent out of shape when people say that he worked for a bank when he actually was uh, he claims to have been a public servant. Now the New York Federal Reserve is bank. It's it's a bank of banks, actually. But um, and he was the head of that. But the point is that that wasn't that wasn't the issue. The issue was that he knew all the same people. He talked to all the same people, and the 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 people that wanted him to move in a particular direction. In this case, uh, protecting the the the, the system. Uh, knew that th those were the steps that he was going to take at any cost. And uh, that that's, uh, we don't talk much, uh, as much about cultural capture 
as we do about, you know, regulatory capture or, or, or the revolving door or whatever else. But cultural capture, I think, really is the defining characteristic, particularly of the financial rescue and, and, and how it was undertaken.